So let's get to it then, and we're really proud to welcome to the pod a man who played rugby league at the highest level, but it's as a coach that he really excelled. Winning almost 70% of his games in charge of Wigan Warriors is a remarkable feat. The fact he did it over a seven-year period and enjoyed constant success is rare, and it's remarkable. It was down to relentless winning behaviours, but what were they? We're going to find out very shortly because he now joins us, having been given the honour of becoming the next head coach of the England Rugby League team. Welcome to the podcast, Sean Wayne. Nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. So look, people talk about high performance. <clears throat> Everyone seems to have a different answer to this question, so I'm, I'm interested what yours is. In your mind, what is high performance? I, I would say what has worked for me, to be honest, Jake, was um, looking after the detail. The, the, the detail is the key, and that's detail in behaviours off the field and on the field. But being relentless in, in delivering them, you know, so we would um, be strict on certain things. I know we play the week before the grand final at the end of the season, so we wouldn't we wouldn't ease off towards the end. So our standards were you know, looking after the coach, cleaning the changing room, being respectful to people, and then the detail on the field. And uh, was the key to it, was being relentless with it. And the reason why I'm pointing there, because we always seem to finish here at Old Trafford in the, you know, for the grand final. But we would be exactly the same at the end of the year and as what we would in, in pre-season. And what I thought was interesting, Damien, when I came to you at the very start to, you know, to, to get your sort of opening line, you didn't say, oh, it's a guy that won everything and it's a guy who lifted trophies and a guy who had victory after victory. You went straight into the kind of father figure type role that Sean obviously played. So it's a reminder that high performance is not just about pushing people to their limits to get the best out of them. It's about improving them as well. Yeah, very much. And I, my, I, I'm lucky enough, I've known Sean. Um, and I know that people that have played for him speak really highly about him as a person, as much as a coach. So those standards he describes, um, both on the field, but they speak about him as a person off the field and the care and attention to detail that he gave them. And I think it's that consistency then that really fascinates Sean around that. So one of my de so one of my favourite definitions of high performance is the gap between your best and worst performance is narrower than everybody else's. Yeah. So how did you establish these standards? I find that quite easy, Damien. It was being very, very clear on what you expect. So, you know, I've, 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 I've speak to a lot of coaches and a lot of people in business and and they seem to wait for people to make mistakes and then jump all over them. And I always remember as a, as a player, I played at Wigan for nine and a half years. And then I got a call saying, we're going to let you go. We're going to, Leeds have made an offer and we want you to go. And, uh, and I said, why? And he said, well, our coach, John Money, doesn't rate you. And, and I thought to myself, I wanted to know that six months ago so I could fix it. And, and I, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay at Wigan, my hometown club. And I left it. And I always remembered whenever, if I ever got a chance to coach, tell everybody everything, all the information, what you expect, are you happy, are you not? And, and that is the key. You know, make sure players understand about your standards and behaviours off the field. And the same when you play. You know, the descriptions of how you play, are your tattle. Repetition, practice, perfect practice is, is the key. So... I think it's that information, tell everybody everything. And then it's not a shock to them when when you're delivering good news or bad news. I've let players go, as in they leave our club. But they know it's coming, they, they know they can't get to the level which I want. And they don't, you know, I, I, I'm still I'm great at speaking terms with many players who I've parted terms with over the years. And that's because I've always been really, really open when I'm happy and when I'm not happy. Right. People that have listened to this pod regularly will, will hear us often talk about fault versus responsibility. And what I love hearing you talk there is that instead of looking for someone to make a mistake and blaming them for the error, it almost feels to me like you're the one taking responsibility. So if a player doesn't deliver, of course you need to speak to them. But I think you are almost thinking, right, that is my fault. As his, as his manager, as his coach, the fact he's done that means I maybe haven't done my job well enough to tell him what I want. That is 100% it. Because I feel it's my job and my assistant's job and my analyst's job to make sure that everybody knows exactly what we want. And if they're not doing it, so if we play a game, win or lose, 
we have a coaching meeting straight after the game and it's have we done everything we can why have they not done what we practiced and we look at it it's us it's you know it's me first and then what have we done in the week and so we never ever had a blame culture ever but it was really important to me and the staff that every time we drove down to a game my team were prepared we knew how to win that game and that's through hard work relentless watching clips two o'clock phone calls you know that sort of thing that that attitude to making sure your team prepared in order to win so what do you do because Damien spoke about this sort of father figure that you had at the club what do you do if you put your arm around a player get to know the player tell the player what you expect tell the player again and again and again and it still it still isn't going in what what's it then do you cut them off get rid yep yeah so but they get a lot of chance so if I'm not happy with what you're doing Jake you come in my office I'd show you footage of it being whatever it is, I'm being done well. This is what I want you to do. So me personally, I'll go out with you after training and we'll work on that specific thing. In games, I'll give you goals. This is what I want you to do. In detail, tip him up before games and then we'll look at it the week after. You're still not doing it. Have a look at what you're doing. The, work with him again and that will carry on. Till at the end, the amount of conversations I've had with players when I've said... What do you think? And they've said, I can't do it. What you're asking me to do? What's the next step? Well, I need to go. And, 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 so they uh, almost come to that conclusion. Yeah, player. Yeah. yeah. Or else, if I'm leaving them at the team, you know, the, the amount of times, and you speak to the players, you know, this is true. The amount of players, what I've said at the end, um, I shouldn't be playing this week. I'm not, I'm not doing what you want. And that was just continual feedback. And when, when I do a lot of speaking, with corporates, big, big, big businesses, and um, and they've explained to me the problems we're having it within the business, and I just said to them, "Have you told, have you told them that? Have you showed them what is the perfect way, what you want?" The fact is, they've not. Hmm. Or they, or they would do for a month and then leave. Why it. is that? Do you think people are scared of, of confrontation? I love confrontation because I feel you want to know. You want you don't want me sacking you. Yeah. you. You want me to know. You want to know that I'm not happy with the way you're playing, Jake. This is how we're going to fix it together. And when you do, you get loads of praise. But if you can't, we're parting ways. But you you want to know. You don't want one day coming me off and saying, right, you're going. And that never happened. Because I think it's a weak way out. You know, the way to do it is be honest, be straight, cur, you know, cur for them. Because that player is going home to his family and kids and wife and, you know, I want him to have a good laugh. But he needs to know where he stands. See, what fascinates me on this, Charlie? Can I just interject there for one second, Sean? I'm getting quite a lot of noise on the tape. Yeah, that's what I talk, sorry. Telling us off. Telling us what he wants. See, what fascinates me there, though, Sean, is that those standards that you're describing, the honesty and and, and, and the candor and the feedback, is that... Where did you learn that? Because I know that you had quite a tough start to your life as well. So to learn some of those lessons um, really interests me of yeah. what happened. There's not many questions I can't answer. But that is one. Because um, I don't have any good memories. I only have bad memories of being a kid. I left home when I was 15. And I mean no good memories, only really bad ones. Um, and then I left home, went living with my girlfriend, um, who I'm now married to, and she's getting kids and been married 30 odd years. She, she, was, she was very, very good on driving us, buying a house in a place in Wigan, which I thought was miles away, but it's only actually five minutes out to Wigan. Um, she, you know, she's had, had an influence on me, um, but that, I think over the years, if I'm honest with you, my dad beat me to a pulp two or three times a week. And I never learned, but what that did, I remember going to bed, wanting to die when I'm eight, nine, 10. And I thought, if ever I have kids, they're never gonna feel this way. So it made me a better dad, mm. you know? So um, when, when Wigan got rid of me, um, I thought to myself, if ever I coach, I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna have a player feeling this way. I'm gonna tell him everything so he knows what's coming. So I think I've learned, you know, 
I've learned how to be a better dad. You know, I didn't want my kids feeling, my kids, I've never laid a finger on them. We have a great relationship, you know. So I, I've, I've learned through, a, a, you know, I had a coach at Wigan who bullied me, tried to bully me. And I wouldn't back down from anybody, but he tried it. And I remember thinking, I will never, ever have a player feeling the same way as you're making me feel now. Right. And uh, so I've learned uh, not to do things quite a bit. As much as that is one of the saddest <clears throat> things I've ever heard anyone say, because we're all parents here, and to, to imagine your child would ever say that is it's heartbreaking, isn't <clears throat> it? But I wonder whether that, as you sort of alluded to there, whether that is the energy source for you to be not just a father to your kids, but to all these players as well, to improve their lives, to educate them, to help them, to, to, to carry them with you and, and to kind of make amends, I suppose, for what you went through. That, is, that feels to me like the, the energy behind your career almost. Yeah, it could be. It, I, to be honest, Jake, I don't know. I'm just very passionate about it. I'm very passionate about being straight with people, being honest. I'm passionate about, very, very passionate about players having a good laugh when they've finished. Mm. You know, so I want to see Sean O'Loughlin in 20 years' time when I'm not coaching, he's not playing, and he owns his house and he's got a good business and that that satisfies me. You know, the thought that a play... And I'm still speaking to players now, but I'm, I'm not the coach anymore. But we still speak every day about business and buying houses and and I have a lot of contacts. It sounds like you're now a dad to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it feels that way. But it makes me feel good, you know. Wow, that's, that's really powerful. And th what I'd, I'd like to explore, if you don't mind, Sean, is something around your journey to be a head coach because there's a little bit about where you had to gamble on yourself at that stage. Yeah. Would you just share a bit about yeah. that? Yeah, so I, I was, from 2000 to 2010, I was working in Manchester. I finished playing. I was working for Tarmac as a KK manager, wanted to be the best, um, and then coaching the kids at Wigan. In the two, evening and weekends. In the evening, yeah. weekends. So I was doing about 120 hours a week. I had kids then. Well, I've still got kids, but I had kids living at home. So my, my day was leaving half five, six, getting to Manchester, working really, really hard. And at dinner time, get my laptop out. I clipped stuff for my under 18, whoever I was coaching. I was on two grand a year doing that. Um, taxed. Sorry, two grand a day or two grand a week? Yeah. Two grand. yeah. Wow. Uh, and then dinner time and then work wow. again for Tarmac because I wanted to be the best. I wanted yeah. I want us to get the best market share. There were three companies in Manchester then. I wanted us to get the most. And, uh, and then get back to Wigan, train the players on my own. I had no assistance. Um, washing kits. And and then uh, and then I get home and then clip training, have my tea, go to bed. So I was doing 100... 120 hours a week for 10 years, decade. Wow. And then in 2010, I got offered a job to be the assistant to Mike McGuire. And the assistant in... in and this in, was at Wigan? At Wigan. Yeah. The assistant job is not well paid. So I was doing quite well with Tarmac then. And I had to, to take the job, I had to lose two thirds of my salary. So I went home to Lorraine and said, listen, I've got this chance of a job. I, want, I really badly want to do it, but I'm losing two thirds of my salary. I had a mortgage then. And, um, and she said, yeah, go for it. You, you will get to say, course job. And I said, yeah. And then that's decent money there. And, uh, and then two years later, I got, I got a job. But see, but, but, but see the, what I wanted to explore there, Sean, is that, mm. that we get people listening to this podcast that maybe have a dream of running a business or going out on their own or pursuing a career. And yet they're in, they've got responsibilities like you had. They've got children, they've got mortgages to pay. Yeah. And the courage... It's often that idea of they have responsibilities that mean that they almost have to put those dreams on hold. Yeah. How did you make that leap from being prepared to lose two thirds of your salary to pursue this dream? What was it that propelled you? I knew I could do it. I knew there'd be nobody what could work as hard as me. And I knew if I got the head coach job, I'd kill it. And I don't want that to sound arrogant, um, but I was really, really confident that my, my work ethic and my beliefs on who we play and who we behave, I knew I knew we'd do well. Um, so it was quite easy for me that it was uh, making making that decision, and, and that's what I've looked at throughout my life. I've I've just thought about when I left home when I was fifteen, all my mates went to prison. Some of them are still in. 
So I had a choice. Am I going to be one of them what sulks and makes an excuse about how my dad treated me and get in trouble? I wasn't going to do something. And I wanted to do something. I wanted to be different. I wanted to win something. I wanted to play for Wigan. But I'll tell you now, I was that far off, it's untrue, being a player from where I come from. Some of the things I did when I was a kid was terrible. Like what? Bad things. You know, breaking in places and right. just shocking things. And that's why I got beaten by my dad because I was doing things wrong, you know. So, um, so I was that far off playing for Wigan. It was untrue. But I loved rugby league. It's all I did. I'd have six, eight weeks not going to school, but to play rugby, I, I loved it. And um, and that was my release. So when somebody says to me, something's impossible, I know anything's possible because I can't tell you how far away I was from playing for Wigan. And then to carry on a coach Wigan, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how far I was away. But I managed to do it through a bit of luck, meeting the right girl, work ethic, and the decisions I had, and I chose them. Stuff happens to you, Damien, and you've got, you've got a choice of, am I going to take that route, feel sorry for myself, am I going to take that route, work hard, and, you know, walk out here, leave my team out here. And, um, and that's, that's what I've done. I think that's such a brilliant message for people because we all know people who are waiting for the perfect time in their life to do something. Yeah. I mean, I can think of five or six of my friends now who are not living the life they want, but whenever I speak to them about it, they say, yeah, but I'm just waiting for like the next couple of years or I'm just waiting for this to happen. But they're my age, they're in their 40s. Well, we've been having that conversation for 20 years. Yeah. And I do think that you get one life, you might get 80 years if you're lucky, most of us are either halfway through or beyond halfway. So you, at one point, you've got to just start doing what you want to do, not waiting for the time to be right. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want, I don't want this to sound depressing, but you, know, you look at the average lifespan of a human, like 79 years, 29,000 days. Yeah. It, you know, why would you waste a day? How old are you now? I'm 55. So let's say 79 is the average, you're 55 now, that gives you what, my mass, 24 years, right? Yeah. So you're well beyond halfway. Do you, do you then say, right, that is even more of a reason to get up tomorrow and make it count? Absolutely. Yeah. When, I'm, when I'm doing this, when I'm speaking to corporates, I talk about not wasting days. Don't spend days with sappers. Spend, day, days, spend your time with people who think a bit like you, forward thinking, what's next? I've got two girls and I've brought them up that way. Never be happy. How do you do that? Like, there's people listening to this going... I say there's two people in life, fountains or drains, right? Mm. If you find yourself surrounded by drains and they are draining you, it's not easy to get rid of those people. What's your advice? It's very, very easy for me um, because I am very, I know where I'm going. And, um, and every day during this lockdown, this is a tough period without a shadow of a doubt. But I've taught myself on every day I go to bed, I'm, I'm going to be a better coach, better dad. You know, better person. So I read a lot and, you know, I, I just, if, if I get torn to somebody and I can tell that they're a sapper, I just don't stay with them. I just, I'm just a bit, not rude, but I just, I can tell within a couple of seconds of meeting somebody what sort of person they are. So it, it's, it was very, very easy to me. And I said that to my kids, you know, never be happy. And my, my wife didn't always agree with that. She, you know, why would you spend all that? I've never been happy. I am totally at ease with that. I think it's a great, a great way of thinking about life. Would you clarify that though, Charlie? So I said to my, my girls, they're very much into promotions and earning more. And I think it's a great way. And that's where I think, what's next? And, um, you know, so I don't want them to go around patting themselves on the back and being happy, I live in this house. What's your next big house and what's your aspirations? And, What's going to make you work hard and get better every day? And, uh, and it's me and my two daughters. My wife doesn't always agree with it. But it's what I've instilled in them. You know, I'm totally at ease with it. I never wanted to walk off after a win. You know, this is true. We win a grand final. That's the end of our season. We've got two months off. And then the day after, I'm going to have a drink with all the players. It's called Mad Monday, but it's on a Sunday. I, don't, I never got that. <laughs> So I'd sit there with the players and enjoy myself. We'd just got a bonus. We've just won a grand final. 
And I'll be thinking, Warrington scored just today. How did they score that try? Even though we won, and it would just p- p- upset me a bit. Thinking, you know, and I'd be thinking about pre-season then. You know, why did Warrington score? And so it was never, ever walking around, patting yourself on the back. You finished your, your best. It was always, you know, make up better. And, and I had that tattoo put on me when I was, had a few drinks. And that's just cares and means make up better, never being happy. So n- nobody can tell me it's quite sad that you're never going to be happy. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I did some work for a bank. And I was talking to a guy who was 45, never gets his bonus. He's just waiting to retire. It was his words for me. I'm just waiting to retire now, Sean. And I said to him, are you, going to, are you going to waste 20 years of your life until you retire to get, that, to get your pension? Every day, you can't wait for Fridays and you hate Sundays. And I feel like saying, yeah. well, just have, get some... See, what you're describing there, the Japanese have the term, the Kaizen for yeah. it, this idea of continuous yeah, improvement. That's it. The, that that's phrase it. that you've yeah. got tattooed on you. So, would you describe the coach you are today from when you started, when you took that leap and you became a head coach after Maguire had left yeah. again? What, like, what would you say has been the biggest improvement you've made? Um, that's a good question. I, I never, ever ever set out with a I want to do this I want to play this way I want to I want to when we're training this is the session I want and this is the way I want to be it, it was just very very easy for me to be very open with the players you know I can walk in an hotel if we're playing in London and I can listen to George Williams speaking to the receptionist and he might say please and thank you and that receptionist is happy um, and, and, and I get him at dinner saying, that I, I heard you, your manners was really good with that moment on reception. And he'd be like, why are you listening to what I'm saying? You know, but I just wanted him to improve as a player. So I never really set out to, with, with a way of, of doing, being the way I am. But I'd say the biggest change now, Damien, is that I 100% know what I'm about. When you start coaching, it's a bit sucker and see, and you're not really sure. No. I'm very, very comfortable of delivering the session, behaviours of, of my players. You know, I, I would drive home from Wigan, eight o'clock at night, the last one out of the club, and I would see a player who I wasn't really happy with, not playing-wise, but something didn't feel right, and I'd call for a cup of tea on the way home. You know, I've been with them all day, but unexpected, uninvited. But just to make sure that it was okay, and, uh, and and I've had a few times where I've seen things in houses where he's got a problem, you know. So, and then ten years later, that player will say to me, "I know, I know, I know why you cut me out," and they appreciate it. But I didn't, I didn't do it um, because I thought it was the right thing. I genuinely, and that's that is the the most important thing. I genuinely cared about him. And quite often you're working with players who are maybe a bit like you have come from the wrong side of the tracks. They might have a difficult upbringing. Certainly in the world of rugby league, you're not taking affluent, the majority are not affluent, yeah. privately educated young men, are they? No, definitely not. So even, even when they're with you and they're in their mid-twenties, you're still very much sort of operating like a parent. When you talk about listening to the way that they speak to people in public, like my kids who are four and seven, I'm doing exactly that. If I think there's something not right with my seven-year-old daughter, I'll let her go to her bedroom, but then I'll just go up and just have a quiet little chat with her. Yeah. And so it is very much that sort of parenting role. If you went to a player's house and something wasn't quite right, what's your approach then? Because it's, one thing is realising it, but it's not always an easy conversation. It's not, but if I felt comfortable enough to say, is everything okay? Yeah. Or else the day after, so just so I don't, I don't embarrass his wife, I get the player in and, man, I didn't feel right about last night. Is, is everything okay? Because I can help you. You know, so just make sure, you know, it, it, I was very, very strict. So we start, we train all day. We don't finish early. We train very, very hard. We lift weights. Your listening video is very, very intense. But, it, but if you have a problem, I'll, I adore my kids. I'm a family man. So I, I do understand that that's your most important thing. So no matter what, 
If you need to go home, Jack, to your family, to your kids, you go home. But when we're in work, we're in, you know. And the players understood that. They understood that. Even though it, 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 we're on it at work and it's very much pressure. The clarity was important. Yeah, the clarity definitely was so important. But they knew I was on their side. I was on the side. It was, I wanted them to have good laughs. But when we're in work, there's a, an attitude I want you to have. Can I just go back to you talking about the happy thing and being really comfortable with never being happy? Yeah. What is wrong with having that relentlessness, having that desire for constant improvement, but after you win a grand final, sitting down, having a beer, and having 10 minutes to reflect and go, yeah, you know what? You've done a really good job. Enjoy the moment, live in the moment. What, what's wrong with doing that, even for a short period of time? Yeah, nothing wrong, nothing. But I'll be thinking about pre-season, and then thinking about how can and this is this is there's not many people know this, but when we play Grand Final here, we go to an hotel in Manchester and me, the CEO, and met a performance about Bitcoin, whatever the night before the game, I would sit down with them and I'd say, right, how do we hundred percent, hundred percent guarantee we're gonna get here next year and we're gonna win? So let him play we talk about them, letting players go who's playing the night after. In a, grand, in a grand final. Let, who do we need to bring in? Who do we need to let go? What do we need to change at the training, training ground? Out of our injuries so, been? So this is the night before the grand final? Yeah. So you're already moving your mindset. Because I think a lot of coaches would say, right, I am 100% focused on tomorrow, the, the next step on the journey. Whereas you're already talking here about having a four or five month window where you're looking at changing players over the, over the shutdown. Yeah. And that, I think that's good. Yeah. You know, long term, me and the CEO talked about five years. You know, I, I, had, I had a desire to dominate the competition and win all three things for five years, then 10 years, try to put things in place. Um, so I love the fact that we were talking the night before this game about how do we 100% guarantee we're going to get here. Made, and we made some really, really tough decisions around that table that night. And we did it every time we got to Old Trafford. So I had these stories about other clubs going. And they're having a meal and a glass of wine and everything's relaxed and we're happy to get there. And we, we was, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be smart here. Mm. This is a fact. You can ask Chris Rodlinski. This is what we did every year. Wow. See, one of the things that I've, <clears throat> I've long admired about you, Sean, is that is there was a game once where you played at Wakefield. Do you remember? And I think you shipped a record number yeah. of, of points in a, in a defeat. And I always thought that the way you handled that that sort of huge loss spoke more about your character than the example that you yeah. offered there about the forward plan in the night yeah. before a grand final. Do you want to explain a bit more about that? Because I, I, because I thought that was a real window into the person that you are. Yeah, that, that day brought me out. That. It was a day we played at Wakefield and an illness had gone through our club. Um, we nearly had to call the game off, which is unheard of. And we lost 62-0. So we went, we, we turned up at Wayfield and all my staff was ill. All the players were ill. I weren't, because I don't get ill. And then I knew before the game and I said to my CEO, I said, we're, we're going to get pumped here. We're going to get beat 30 nil. We're in trouble. And then when they come in for the warm-up, I looked at my players, Tony Club, who's a real tough character, and he, he was gone, white, ill. So I've never had flu, but... It was like a real bad illness, and they was exhausted. And they went out and played a game of rugby, which is the most brutal of sports. So after the game, we got beat 62-0. I've never been beaten like that in my life, ever. But I knew there was a reason for it. So we come in after the game, and I said, this game will never be mentioned again. It, I'll never review it. I'm going to give you time off with your families. Days, four days off. Relax, sleep. And, and the players were ecstatic, loved it, and, and they come back, and I think we won the comp that year. Yeah, yeah, you did, but I think, with, <clears throat> but publicly as well, the public face that you presented after that game wasn't making excuses, wasn't no. taking anything away from the opposition that had done it. And this is a powerful thing that I wanted to explore about, that people remember um, how you handle success, but equally how you handle adversity, and I thought there was a consistency in your approach yeah. at both of those moments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, fair play to Wayfield. They beat us, they, they, they put 62 points past us 
when nobody's ever done that before. So there's no way was I uh, diminishing what they've done, what they've what they've achieved. You know, they play well, but privately with my players, I was on their side. I get it. I understand. And there's no team would put 62 points past one of our teams, and I get the reasons why. So it was not making excuses or publicly, but privately supporting the players and making sure they get the time off to make sure that. And it took us weeks to get over that game because it, it just wiped us out. Yeah. So what is your advice to people listening to this pod who revel in success, love being successful, they're driven to live a great life, but dealing with failure is a real issue for them? Yeah, I've, you know, we've lost grand finals, we've lost games, and, and it hurts. I, I am probably the world's worst loser, but there's, there's things, you look at every single defeat, and there's always something, ways of making sure that doesn't happen again. And, you know, why, why did we lose the game? But always making sure the first person you look at is yourself. Mm. What, what have I done? And then, and then spreading it out and, and finding Self -reflection's a Self-reflection is not easy for a lot of people, though, Sean. That's what... It has to be. It, that is the... Showing that humbleness. I, 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 would, I would gladly go through video show me players, I've got 30 players there who want to learn something and I'm showing them how St. Helens play and this is how we're going to beat them. And then if I had a player like Sean O'Loughlin say something to me, um, I, I don't agree with that, Wayne. I think we should change that and I would make a decision. And I, I, think I wanted him to do that, it, it, having that humility, that humbleness. Sean O'Loughlin is massively more be better than I ever was a player. So why would I not listen? I've got some great players in my team, so having that humbleness and humility to say, I don't know it all, let's do it all together. Um, having that self-reflection. I've walked in after games and said, I got it wrong at half-time. The information that I give you was wrong. Mm. I'll never do it again. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, I think it's a really important quality of leadership, that, because I think quite often people are in a lead, leadership position and almost the biggest, the biggest thing to admit is that they might not have the answer to something. And yeah. all too often, people who are in that, that position of power, they, they don't even dare say, look, guys, I, I don't have the answer to this. I, w I wonder whether any of you do. And sometimes admitting what you don't know is far more valuable and important to the team around you than admitting what you do know. But can you imagine the buying you get from your players by doing that? Yeah. I've done, it, I've done that many times. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something which I did a lot is I knew what I wanted. But I've shown clips and said, what, what do you think here? Wanting them to come out with the things I'm thinking. You know, I know what I want from that situation. And they've said it. And because it comes from them, it's a bit more powerful and your buying's better. And, you know, so it's... Uh, That's often referred to then, Sean, in coaching as like that guided discovery that you know where you want to get to and you're going to help them to guide your way there. Did you start that or was that something that you learned after you were a head coach? It's something which I've learned over the years, which I've become more comfortable with. When I first started coaching, when I was in my 20s, um, you know, I was the same as everybody else. Drill, and I'm going to give you on from it, all that. But over the years, I've just learned to be very comfortable in how, what I do and how I deliver it. And, and I don't know the answer to this. You're miles better than me. Tell me what you think. And, so... Take me into a dressing room at half time with you then where your yeah. players have come in, they're tired and they're exhausted. What would you say is the is the optimum amount of time that you would be speaking to those players and giving them instruction? Very, very short. Not long. A the minute, one, two minutes? Three minutes, two and a half minutes at the most. Um, the most important thing is hydrated. So the first thing is Everybody quiet, have a minute, get your breath, get hydrated. So all my physios go in, all my assistants go in, get the players, and that's what they were told to do. I want the players hydrated as much as they can. And then it will be me. We, we, we have a, a real detailed game plan, but we drill it down to two or three points, key points. Very, very simple. Lots of information early in the week, and we just make it really small so you focus towards near the game was really was tiny. And then m m my job then at half time was 
Is it working? Are we doing what we said we would do? I would normally have the points on the wall. So are we doing what we said? And is it working? And and then the player might say, I don't think it's working. Well, let's change it. At the end of the day, I want to win that game. So I'm not bothered who comes up with it. If you're in our dressing room and you come up with a fantastic comment, I'm taking it up. I'm taking it on because I want one thing and that's win that game. So when the players come up with it, the physio, I don't give I don't give a damn who it is. So it will be very, very open, very, very clear. And the players know, they know me, and they know the one thing I'm obsessed about is winning. So now that you've taken over the national coaches' yeah. role, where these, you will have players that don't know you, that aren't yeah. as familiar with your style and your approach, how are you going to speed that process up to accelerate that, that comfort that they can challenge, they can disagree? The one, the one thing which this has brought out for me, Damien, is Zoom, Teams meetings. So I'm doing that a lot with different pockets of players and I'm just giving them loads of information. So I'll show them footage, what they can see or show me screen in Australia and I'll talk over this footage and then gradually, they, you know, I, I can see the players' pictures at the bottom of the screen and I can see them smirking when I've said things and they'll be thinking... I imagine they're thinking, I know why now we can play the way they play because I'm just talking talking through games. And um, so I'm just doing a lot, a lot of that, whereas um, loads of Zoom meetings, loads of contact with the players. And, it, and it's the future because when we're back to normal and we'll be very soon, um, what a way for me to speak to James Graham in Australia and Luke Thompson in St. Helens and Scott Taylor in all... Just, just send out a Zoom meeting, show them loads of footage. So it's going to be continuous. And we're recording this during the coronavirus shutdown, so you haven't even had a chance to be in person with your England players yet since since you got the job. Congratulations, by Thank the way. Thank you very much. The culmination of relentless hard work and not a lot of happiness over many yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the first message that you want to give them when you get together? I mean, there might be a few listening to this, so they might get it early, but how do you want to impose upon them what you are, what the team will stand for? I am very different to what they've had before. There's no question about that. I know what, I've been a coach when I've let players go to England and Great Britain. So it's very, very different. There's, there's, there's things which I, I owe very, very um, important, which they've not had before. So it's making sure their messages about behaviours, standards, behaviours in camp, um, how we're going to play. So they, they had a playbook, which was huge. So we've got players for less amount of time because we're international and we're giving them more things to work on. So it didn't make sense. So over these past few weeks, me and my assistants have just been relentless in watching games and we've come up to a few, come up with a, two or three absolutely key points what's going to win test matches. And everything uh, is fed back to the players. So when they play for the Super League team, then points what we've given them. If you want to be an England player, you need to do this. There's a, there's a brilliant book by Bob Iger, who's the CEO of the Disney company until, until recently. And in it, he talks about one of his superpowers is an absolute rock solid belief in the decisions that he's making. So that if anyone tries to pick a hole in any part of it, he can answer them. And he thinks that all too often, perhaps people try and make a decision which is going to please everyone around them. And then when they get questioned on it and they don't really believe the decision they've made, that's when it all falls apart. So I wonder whether when you're stepping into a dressing room of players you've not worked with before, players who've had years of a different coach, yeah. players who are used to a different setup, do you compromise your approach in any way or do you just stick to the absolute rock solid belief, your own superpower that you know that the way you operate will win? Yeah, there's a, there's a few simple principles which I won't bend on. It's non negotiable. Can you tell us what those are? Well, it's just things are. in your behaviours and standards and, con, you know, right. there's detail in how we're, how we're playing. Um, but I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm coaching the best players in our, in our game, our country. So. It would be foolish of me not to listen to them and not to adapt the way we're playing, but there's a few real simple things. And what I, what I have learned over the years in, in, in uh, organisations, whether it's sport in a business, is the stronger the, stronger the organisation, the better they do the simple, the real simple basic things. And by that, I mean, for a rugby team, 
it's your core skill. You, you, you catch and pass your contact. And them real simple basics, but done under pressure. Your behaviours, your standards, beliefs on what it's about. is. And I've, I've always like done, done at a pyramid where that thick bottom layer is just simple things. And it's the same playing for England. I, I want them simple things done really, really well. You look at games, test matches, World Cup finals, where teams would turn the ball over. The simple core skill errors. So don't tell me it's not important. So what, what I see corporate organisations who are not travelling well, they don't answer the phone well. They don't turn up to meetings on time. It's them simple, basic things. And they want this bell, bells and whistles, flashy performance here, but they've not... And you think answering the phone right and speaking to a receptionist well is going to win games of rugby? Everything. Turn up on time, have the rat kit on, eat well, say thank you to the chef, get on the field on time. When I say we're starting, we're starting, you're prepared, you've looked after yourself at all, everything. So how is this going to help? So in 2021, we're going to try and win, or England are going to try and win a World Cup that they haven't managed since 1972. So how we, how is this going to help build that belief that we're capable of of winning it for the first time in 40 odd years. The reason for this meeting here, Damien, is I have footage of Australia, New Zealand, Tonga defending and attacking. And I was going to inform the players of when they defend like this, we attack like this. When they attack like this, we defend like this. And you, and you will really disrupt them. Because what I believe is, I don't know if you agree, I think you will, but when a team's playing against us, when they're feeling good and they're confident, how can we stop it? So when the team's defending and they're really confident in how they defend, how can we change the way they defend? So if a, if a team defends from touchline to touchline, the space is wide, we go short passing, go through them, yeah. and make them tighten up to so change things. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just that information, giving them, saying that this is how Australia defend. Well, if they defend that way against us, we are going to and, and just... I want them players driving home, pulling onto the drives at night, thinking, we're going to beat them. I, I know, I believe in what he's saying, them players will get Australia. We will score. That try they score against against New Zealand, they won't score against us because he's just told us a way how we can stop it. So it's just building that belief. And, and giving them evidence that, it's, evidence. that we're this capable is, of doing this it. This is yeah. how they defend and this is how we can attack and go and practice it. And, you know. But it's not fake belief. I'm not trying to sell something to them. I honestly believe we can do it. And when we train against our Knights and, and, and they play, they'll defend like Australia, we actually practice exactly the things I've, I've just been showing them on video. Yeah. Listen, we're almost out of time, um, but there's just a couple of things I want to pick up on. I, I've found this conversation fascinating. So first of all, I know you two are friends. So Damien, thanks for organising it. And oh no, it's been a treat. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Um, there's a really nice quote from a guy called Inky Johnson, who was an American football player, a college player, and he was one game away from making it into the NFL. And he came, not dissimilar to you, from a really difficult upbringing. And he had decided that he was going to make it to the NFL for his family. And in the final game, he took a tackle, a really bad tackle, and it paralysed him down his left-hand side. And he laid there and he simply couldn't believe that one game from achieving a multi-million dollar contract and changing his whole family's life was taken away from him. But he's gone on to be an inspirational speaker and a leader. And the phrase he uses is, impose your will. And I just think it's such a powerful phrase because it doesn't matter whether you're trying to win huge games in rugby league, whether you're trying to run a business, whether you're trying to find your dream job, whether you're trying to be a better parent, whether you're just trying to live the life that will put a smile on your face, impose your will is almost the single most important thing you can do. And it just strikes me, Sean, that right from the day that you made the decision to leave home or you were thrown out and you went off and did your thing, you've imposed your will on every little part of your life. Yeah, it makes sense. I appreciate that. It makes total sense to me. I but, get it. But my issue is, if it doesn't make you happy, what's the point? Yeah, to, to be honest, Jake, I don't sit there, you know, I sit there the day after the grand final and I have a beer and I enjoy it. But my passion is planning on what's next and, and 
winning more. And is it I being happy but not that? being satisfied? Is that a fair reflection? Is it what? You can be happy and you will experience happiness, but not satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do enjoy it. You know, me and my wife travel to France for three weeks. We just want to double and we have a glass of wine and I sit back and we want to double, you know. You know, but then when I'm driving down the road, I will be thinking about a training camp and different ways of playing. It's just never, ever switching off. And that's a relentless attitude, which, you know, many, many coaches will have that sort of attitude, but they don't switch off. And I think that um, whatever walk of life people are in, a relentless attitude, imposing your will, getting what you want out of this life is, um, is something that everyone can do more of, probably. Yeah, and I've always wanted my teams, my staff, us to be different. Don't be the same as anybody else. Dress better. Go on, at the coach, what we travel on, is the best coach there is available. So it's making sure that we, um, the players understand that I get the best coach, but we have to look after it. You know, when we get off, I want it clean. You know, I'm 55, I tied up after myself. I want that coach company saying, they're a great sporting organisation, they look after everything. And we've had that said, but I think if you nail that sort of thing, the detail you want on the field to win a, tr a cup, that's what you get. You know, you can't, the, it, it, they both don't work. You can be sloppy off the field and, and nail your detail on the field. It doesn't work and, and that's what was so important to me. Yeah, those small things do matter. Yeah. So we, we're going to ask you some quick questions now, Sean, that yep. we normally finish all the podcasts with. Um, so what advice would you give a teenage chain uh, just starting out? Work harder than anybody else. Yeah, work harder than... Nobody can accuse you of not working, your work ethic not being there. What are the three non-negotiable behaviours that everyone around you has to buy into? Look to improve. Be a good bloke. And look to improve. Be a good bloke. The third one will be um, look after your craft. You know, look after, give yourself your best shot. Don't have days off. Look to improve. Look after what you're good at. Love it. Okay. So we've touched on this briefly, but are you happy? Yeah. Very. I love my family. I love my job. I, I love what... I, it's very, very, very sad what's happening. But we have to make the best of it, and that's what I'm doing. Very good. How important is legacy to you? Yeah, not, it's not a driving factor. I don't give it any thought. I just, I just want to be able to see a player in 20 years' time, and he's glad he's met me. If, if if I can have that effect on a player where he'll see me in a pub and he, he's, he's glad he's, he's been coached by me and he's met me, that'll, that'll do me. And one golden rule to live a high-performance life? It's all in the detail. Brilliant. Listen, thank you so much for being part of the High Performance Podcast. Just sitting and chatting for these few minutes, I'm now completely of the opinion we're going to be the world champions before <laughs> long. <laughs> so if you've done it for us, I'm sure you'll do it for your New England players. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about hitting your table in your microphone. <laughs> you a bit animated. Listen, it's all about learning, right? There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. All good. Top man. Thank you.